Hey guys, welcome to Mind Body Fuel with Scott Laidler. So we're going to go through a few questions that have come in over the course of the month, whether from my online personal training clients or from different parts of social media or around the internet. So the first question is, I'm apprehensive to start exercise and I feel like I need to wait until I have energy first. What should I do? So th that's an important an important thing to consider because you're right to be a little bit apprehensive about starting uh, a challenging protocol, but it's almost like you can't, if you're in a state of low energy or you're just out of practice, deconditioned from exercise, you don't want to wait too long before you get into training because, well, one, it tends to get worse if you don't get into training. But second is that exercise itself is is energizing. It's it's a, It acts like a dynamo. So you don't want to wait. It's, it would almost be like waiting for, you know, all the all the traffic lights to be green before you started a journey. So you do want to get into your training regime, but you just have to be a little bit hesitant about taking on the, the most challenging protocols. So let's unpack that a little bit more. If you're if you're coming into a training regime and you're a little bit compromised it's been stressful it's been a hard time you're you're deconditioned you haven't exercised for a long time then one of the things that you don't want to do is go into high volume training um too much high intensity training or try to compare what you're doing now to what you used to do if you had had that level of conditioning before so don't be afraid to get into exercising but just make sure that it's calibrated correctly from where you are so just daily steps really making sure that you get some activity in making sure that you get appropriate resistance training in and some moderate cardio and over time as long as you give it the right amount of rest like i say that's going to act like a bit of a dynamo and it's actually going to give you energy so that apprehension you're right to feel it about a very tough program but there's no need to to wait for a time when you have more energy because exercise is going to be one of the things that gives you that so Welcome to the live stream, guys. This is this is the first live stream. I usually do these just to a camera, so it's 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 new for me. Fascinating to to get started. If if you have any questions, please let me know. Put them in the chat, and um, we can always come back to those at the end of the questions that I have prepared. But yeah, I find this quite quite exciting and quite fun. So the next question we have is away from the the health and fitness world. It's how should I start meditating? And when I say that it's away from the health and fitness world, it really isn't because, you know, the mind body is inextricably linked and there's no escaping that link. So meditation is one of the habits that I recommend to a lot of my online clients. It's something that I do on a daily basis or, or as good as a daily basis as I can. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to almost zoom out of your emotions and sit and observe what's happening before you experience it if that makes sense so you know if you're start if you're feeling overwhelmed so let's start again so if you're particularly feeling stressed or compromised or you know there's a lot of corporate fatigue or burnout those kind of things then meditation is one of those things that can be a little bit restorative and when you're experiencing this overwhelm, maybe even anxiety, these kind of things, having a regular meditation practice can be something that gives you that time back. So really allows you to, like I say, see um, see the feelings that you would have felt, but you see them coming and it's almost like they, they brush over you, uh, which is very, very useful because you, you're then no longer a victim of those emotions and that overwhelm. And it starts to tip the balance back in your favor in terms of recovery, you know, restorative things. And once you're no, no longer compromised by stress and you have that a little bit of restoration and extra energy, then your mood's gonna go up, your energy's gonna go up. And the way it's linked to health and fitness is that you're gonna have better performances uh, in the gym and you're gonna start making better decisions with your nutrition. You know, because if you're in a good state, if you're observing potential negative emotions rather than experiencing them, then those negative emotions aren't going to be leading you to be making somewhat compromising decisions in terms of what you eat. And this is what we mean with comfort eating and, and, and that kind of thing. So where would you get started with meditation? I think you should start with the body. So one of the things that I, I did this in my 20s from a book 
called um, The Master Key System by Charles Harnell. And it's a little bit of an uh, esoteric book, but one of the first things it does is it teaches you to, I, I like the idea of setting timers. I find them very useful. You just set a timer. So let's say, for, for our example, we'll say a six minute timer. You set a six minute timer and you just sit cross-legged or in a comfortable position, but your only goal is to not move a muscle. And that's it. That's where you begin with meditation, in my opinion. You start with the physical body. And that seems easy, but it's actually really hard, um, you know, just to not move a muscle. It takes a little bit of time to get used to that, particularly if you don't have a meditation practice. The thing that happens, though, and, and it's a little bit frightening when you first start doing it, is that you you're then free to hear all of the mental chatter, all of that ongoing conversation, if there's any negative self-talk, if there's any limiting beliefs, those will all be playing out as you sit there. You're just saying, oh, I'm not trying not to move my legs, trying not to move my arms, or what's going on in my head? Because we don't necessarily have that turned up in our, in our mind volume-wise. So it just becomes the background noise. But when there's nothing else going on, you start to hear that. And it can become a little bit unsettling at first, but you have to get over that. It's the, it's one of those things where, you know, going through the hardship is part of the journey to get to the other side. From that point, once you're confident that you could sit and, and do a six minute timer, eight minute timer, 10 minute timer and not move a muscle, then we can say that you have control over your body. So that's step one. Once you've got control over your body, that's fantastic. Now we need to start thinking about the mind. And I think one of the, the preconceptions about meditation is that, you know, when you say somebody meditates or I meditate every day, that kind of thing, you think that they're just like this enlightened Zen individual that can just switch all thoughts off. And, you know, that, that's easy for them or second nature for them. But it's not. We, we are waiting for, fighting for, our ambition is to get these moments, tidbits, fleeting moments of quiet but they're worth so much that it's, it's like a gem. It's like, a, it's like the equivalent of a gem. You get one of those, you get one of those moments where there's nothing going on. That, that's fantastic. You know, it sounds like it wouldn't be a good thing, but if you can switch the mind off, that is absolutely fantastic and very restorative. Um, so one of the things, one of the analogies that I use for meditation is that you just imagine yourself a cat looking at a, a hole in the wall, knowing that there's a mouse there somewhere and the, the cat represents your conscious mind. The mouse represents um, thoughts. And you just watch that wall. As soon as a mouse points its head, the cat is going to try and get it. It never gets it, but it's pretty interested in doing it for the rest of its life. It's, it's that dynamic. And we just have to sit back into that, accept that when, a, when a, a thought comes, we try to swipe it. We'll never get the mouse. We'll never get the mouse. But we might get some time where the mouse knows not to raise its head and that will be good enough for us. And then you go on from there. That's how you start. You can then get into transcendental medita meditation. You know, when, when you start having um, something to repeat to yourself, uh, you start doing 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the, in the afternoon, you have a mantra, uh, you can have coaching for that or you should have coaching for that. But you start where you start and you take meditation when you can get times to meditate and you use it like anything else. You, 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 when you know you need a little bit more, you put a little bit more in your regime. It's one of those things that I would consider a fundamental. So it's something that should always feature, but it's also something that you can manipulate and turn up in response to how you're feeling on a, on a, about, you know, in a given period of your life. If it's particularly stressful, then up your meditation. And there will be other things that you can do up your cold showers, you know, up your time in nature, up your time around animals, those kind of things, or whatever it is for you, watching comedy or something like that. You need to react to the external world with the things that you know protect you internally and physically, and meditation is one of those things. So, yeah, I hope that helps on, on that side. So the next question is, how much water should I drink, and do you have any tips on how? So generally speaking, you want to be bringing in about two liters to two and a half liters a day. You're going to take into account your scenario um, in terms of if you're in a situation where you're in a very warm place, you, you don't necessarily want the same amount of, of uh, 
water as somebody else, you're going to want a little bit more. Uh, just, you know, if you're living in the Middle East or something like that, Florida, somewhere like that, you're going to need more water. But the, the challenging thing is we all know that we need enough water, but how do we bring it in? And the answer to that is priming your environment. So if you can set little, we're almost going to say traps, but they're, they're little cues or triggers to get you to almost manipulating your, your own mind um, to get more water in. So an, an easy win would just be to keep water in the bedroom. You go to sleep at night, you have a glass of water, you wake up in the morning and just a rule that you impose on yourself is I don't leave the room in the morning until I've had a glass of water. So that guarantees you two glasses of water a day just, just by going to bed and waking up, which you're gonna do anyway. So that is how you stack, that's how you start to stack habits. You go to bed anyway, you have a going to bed process and, and regime and, and you know sequence same thing when you wake up now just add water to it because you were going to do it anyways cost you nothing now you've got two glasses of water probably only need five or six a day to hit your target where else could you get it from could you have it in the car just keep water in the car there's another one there so i'm having a drink here i know i'm going to do this for a little while so there's a drink here this is actually tulsi tea this is a nice um ba holy basil leaf tea no caffeine because it's quite late um, but you just stack the odds in your favor by priming the environment. And you can do that with anything. So, for example, if we wanted to, to do a, a mobility practice in the morning, we would just leave the mat out overnight. We see it in the morning, bang, straight into the mobility practice, do the same thing with water. There's 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 a caveat to that. You don't want to. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, as with the human body uh, in many aspects, there's there's an element where too much water can be a bad thing, uh, particularly if you start to interrupt your electrolyte balance. So if you're drinking too much water, you can actually flush out your electrolytes and then you'll start getting headaches and you'll start getting muscle tension, spasms, cramps, those kind of things. The ironic thing is that you get that same thing with dehydration as well. So it's it's a the area in the middle is well hydrated and both extremes cause pretty much the same symptomology. You can tell if you're well hydrated, but you, you want the color of your urine to be like lemonade, basically, not completely white all the time, not completely clear all the time, and not too dark because those are indications of overhydration and, and dehydration. So that's what you want to achieve. Two to two and a half liters is appropriate for most people. And then, you know, if you're introducing things like warm bath, Epsom salt bath, saunas, those kind of things, you need to up it to, to take that into consideration. So let's go on to the next question. Oh, one more thing about the meditation while, while, we're, while we're talking, or while I'm talking, is that there's no, there should be no judgment in meditation. If you don't get access to those moments of quietness where there's no mouse in the mouse hole, don't worry about it. It is what it is. The process was worthwhile. Just doing the process is a success, is a win, because you sat down and you did it. That's a win in itself. No judgment with meditation. No one's better at meditating than you and all of that kind of thing. And you didn't do worse this time than you did before. You just do it and you, you just kind of surrender to what to what happens. And, and that's part of the whole thing, really. Okay, so the next question. How do I choose starting weight? So this comes up a lot for me. With, I, I do online personal training. So um, the you need to calibrate weights correctly when you're starting out a training regime the reason for that is if you if you go too heavy straight off the bat then you know you're upping your risk of injury if, you, if you're not competent in a given movement or range of motion and then you stack weight on that you're just raising the chances of getting injured so the the broad rule there is that we never compromise technique for weight i'll tell you why in a second uh, there's another reason for that but you want to go say that say most training programs when you begin with resistance training is broadly going to be in the higher rep ranges for that reason, because, you know, a trainer, a coach is going to know that you don't want to start with one to five reps because that's the realm of strength training. But to get to one to five reps to be challenging enough, it needs to be heavy. And if you don't have the prerequisite technique down and then you go heavy, then the chances of getting injured are going to be you know, multiplied. So you just go for, say that the program is asking you for 10 reps, you go through, you calibrate, you're always deliberately going a little bit lighter than you think you could do. If you're pleasantly surprised, you can put the weight down and go for a slightly heavier one. You don't want to be negatively surprised. So you just always operate like that. I'll still operate like that when I'm calibrating for a new training regime. 
which is important. I've been training for over 10 years, maybe 15 years, but I still need to take time to calibrate my weights when I change my training protocols. If I'm going from one, um, if I'm going from a rep range of say one to five strength training, and then I'm going to a rep range of up at 15 or 20, I'll take a day in the gym to do that calibration. Because if I make the wrong estimation, then it's not really dangerous for me at this stage because I understand the, the, the boundaries of my body, but I don't want the wrong calibration either. If I get the calibration wrong, and I, I'm then not going to be able to progress over time because the initial uh, estimate was wrong. So that brings me to why all of this is important. The reason this is important that you get your starting weights correctly, if we take away the injury risk, that's one thing, that's the obvious thing, you don't want to get hurt. But the reason that you need weights to be correct, and that you need to know what weights are, is that one of the biggest mistakes you can make with training is not recording the weights you, you use. Because if you don't record the weights, then it becomes a little bit chaotic. You just go into the gym looking for a good workout, but you don't know whether that workout is better than the last workout because it wasn't recorded. So you can't trace back your results. You have to know what you lifted, uh, for how many, for how many sets, for how many reps, and you need to know what the rest period was. And then if you're looking to progress on that workout, you need to know that the, the rest period is the same and that you're moving up in weight by the smallest increment or, or bringing down the rest period or slowing down the movement. But there needs to be something that, that's, that's making that set or that workout harder than the one before, that's asking more of your body than the one before. And that's what we call overreaching or progressive overload. And that is going to force adaptation. And that's how you make results over time. Well, that's how you keep going uh, over time and really get results You know, over the course of a year. If we take that Olympic mentality, they are training four or sometimes eight years prior. They know what their, their plan is going to be four or eight years to peaking for it for an event, for a games. So if we look at that in our everyday lives and we say, okay, so over the course of a year, I want to get to, to I want to get from A to B. I'm going to need to go through various different training protocols. And I can't just skip from one to the next without exhausting it because I'm I'm you at that point you're really squeezing the amount of results or progress you're going to get from any given protocol so you extend it over time you make sure that you exhaust it you take it to the point that either your body's fatigued or it's just stopped paying dividends and the only way you can be sure on that is if you stay in that progressive overload that adaptation that overreaching then when you get to the point where you hit that marker of fatigue or there can be psychological fatigue as well sometimes it can just be too boring to keep doing it for more and more weeks and that's something to consider as well. But when it's time to leave a given protocol, you leave it, you take an active rest week. And from that point, you know that you can come back stronger and force adaptation again through contrast. That's how strength training works. If you're going in, just going into the workout or going into the gym every time, just looking for a, a hard workout, then it's all a little bit too chaotic. And you might get great standalone workouts, you might get that kind of sweat equity where you know you've worked hard, but it's not weaving the narrative that we want to see between workouts. We want to know, okay, we started at 10 kilograms on a given weight, then we did 12.5, then we did 15, then 17.5, now we're up at 27.5, look how far we've come, but we're starting to feel a little bit fatigued, sleep isn't what it was, not feeling 100%, it's time for a rest, uh, a rest week, and then we come back stronger on a different protocol. So that's really the, the magic behind uh, strength training. And the magic behind strength training is that there is no magic. It's just keeping things as controlled uh, as possible. You control all your variables and you can predict what's going to happen. So another question that came in is what's my morning routine? So my morning routine at the moment is I'll wake up. I'll set, like I said, I like timers. So I'll set a 10 minute timer just to, to clean up my, my whole workspace, home environment. I'm working uh, from home. So I have a home office and then I just clean up everything for that 10 minute timer so that I start the day in, in a nice clean space. I, I think if, you, if, you've got the, if you've got the place orderly, then that's reflective of your mind um, and that frees you up. I, I feel like if there's, you know there's things undone or there's things, you know, that it, shouldn't be that way it should be cleaned up and things like that it owns a proportion of your space mental space for the day um then i'll do some movement historically that's been something that i i probably neglected for too long in my my earlier stages so 
I now have to force myself to, to, to prioritize that. It's not the thing that I go to. If I want to have fun exercising, I'll go lift weights, I'll go do martial arts, I'll go sprint, I'll go throw something heavy. The, the yoga side of things, the Pilates side of things is very much a, a, a discipline that's being cult cultivated out of necessity. So that, that's why it's so early in the day. Um, because, you know, the things that you snack early in the day, those are the things or the, really the things that you find hardest or find hardest to get into your regime should be the things that you have earliest on in the day or the place in your day where almost nothing can get in the way of it because then you stack the odds in your favor. All of these things, all of these habits and all of these rituals and, and, and morning routines, you have to broker a deal with yourself. You have to be realistic. Like if you don't do it, if you don't like doing cardio, then put your shoes by the door and get up and do it first thing in the morning. Least chance of anything getting in the way. It's that whole concept of eat that frog. You know, if, if, if you to wake up and, and it's a bit of a horrible analogy, but if the first thing you did, every, it's a Brian Tracy analogy, old school personal development, is that if the first thing you did every day was to eat a frog, you'd have done the hardest thing for that day and everything else is easy. So apply that to your health and fitness, apply that to your, to your work life, to your business, that kind of thing. It, pays dividends over time the next thing i'll do is then i'll plan the day so usually on a sunday i'll have planned the week but it's nice to have a little bit of a, a plan again five ten minute timer plan the day and then i like to walk around the the local area i have some allotments like a big green space close to me so i'll go out and and just have a walk around there and, and think about what i'm planning to do then if i get the opportunity I, i'll um I'll have that meditation because that mat from the mobility work is still out. It's a, it's a cork mat. So it feels like it's lends itself to meditation as well. And then the next thing I'll do is I'll start my work day, my work day, aside from the planning, which is a bit of a, you know, more of a personal development thing. The work day starts with either an early morning uh, personal training session or a checking in with my online personal training clients. And then that habit set switches over, to the workday habit set. So I had the morning routine habit set and then I'll switch over to the, to the, um, to the work habit set. So the, the, the thing that I, I find this quite um, not emotional, but I, I, it's quite a, a thing for me because as a personal trainer, I, my whole career was 6am personal training sessions. So I, from London, I, I live in Northwest London. I was always working in central London. I would have a, an hour drive, a 45 minute drive at that time into central London to get to my first client. So as a personal trainer, you would have one of your, or really your only health risk is a lack of sleep. So if, you, if you're running on quite low sleep, you don't want to then steal sleep to have a morning routine because you could probably get some of those things later on in the day, in your downtime. So I always wanted a morning routine and I never had it for, for maybe 10 or 12 years. And now I have one, it makes me quite happy. So it's just one of those things, but you know, even within that, to, to just caveat that, you still try to get what you can get. So if you're in a situation where you don't have a, you're not working from home or that's changed, used to, and now you, that's been taken away, you just try to get what you can get. Maybe you still have to walk to the station, you know, London, but those kind of things. So can you listen to something positive, stimulating, you know, motivational while you walk to the, then can you read a book on the train? Then if you get to work early, can you find somewhere to sit and have a five minute meditation, something of that nature? So you're just trying to to take back some of that morning routine. And I used to do the same thing. If I were to get to, to a client or to the gym early, I, I would just turn the lights off in the car. It was still dark most of the year. Um, and then just set a timer again, a five, six minute timer, do a meditation. And you just try to get that morning routine as best you can. But try not to steal from sleep because that's one of the major restorative factors. Okay, so the, the next question is, I'm 20 years old and want to start ex exercising to gain muscle. Any tips? So, yes. So when, when you're 20, that is your peak, peak uh, sort of metabolic age. So you've got the hormones working for you. You've usually got the lifestyle working for you and you've got the recovery working for you. So my advice would be, do all of your due diligence in terms of how you set your workouts up and how you set your training up and learning the right technique, learning the right coaching. You don't want to hurt yourself. But at the same time, once you've got all of that under your belt, this is where you gain your muscle mass. This is where muscle mass is, is given at a higher rate than it is in other times in life. So if you're starting in your 20s, get your muscle mass now because it all 
help your metabolism down the line. It really helps you build that foundation that you can you can use, you know, basically forever. Um, that would be my recommendation. And, and luckily, that's what I did. I, I, I got interested in, in health and fitness, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Rocky movies, those kind of things. So my friends and I, we would we would go to the gym and we did a lot of bodybuilding style training uh, in our in our mid in, in maybe early to mid to late twenties, and, and we put on some size that and now we don't have to over index in that area so much now because we we got an amount of size that we were quite comfortable with, and now we get a little bit more yin and yang to things because back back then at that age, I have to be honest, it was a it was a pain point it, gaining that size uh, or feeling like you weren't at the size you wanted to be. It was a particular pain point, so it had to be dealt with emotionally and psychologically and physically we fix the physical problem but then you don't want to you don't want to plaster over the physical problem with the physical solution and and leave the uh the emotional and psychological side unchecked because if for whatever reason and this has happened to, to me and people i know if you get compromised with an injury or, or something of that nature a health ailment short term or long term then you can lose size and if you were too invested in that identity that what you had was your muscularity and what you had was your size and then that gets taken away who are you at that stage and that's a very uh confronting reality to deal with so make sure that it's wonderful to pursue that size but pursue other sides of yourself as well you know the holistic side of things the 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 unconscious work the, the shadow work those kind of things cultivating character cultivating personal development because if you leave all of that and you just invest in the the superficial, then you'll be in trouble if that ever gets taken away. And, and ultimately, in a long enough timeline, it does get taken away. That might have been a bit of a deep question for uh, which workout should I do at 20? But but it's it's all there to, to um, it, it all, you, you'll face it all, and it's all part of the journey. Another thing I would say is don't neglect mobility. It's, it's not going to be a, a it's not going to hit you head on at that age, but that's a that's a bill that comes later if you don't do a lot of mobility work in your 20s. So just minimum effective dose, get your mobility in, get into to yoga or Pilates, make sure you sit and, and listen to a few songs and have a stretch after every workout because, you know, you'll be glad you did later. And the other thing is don't take shortcuts. Try not to take short term measures to satisfy that psychological, emotional need to get where you want to be as quick as possible, because some of those short-term measures may or may not be detrimental to your long-term. One, they're not teaching you the right things. You want a steady progression. You want to earn your progression. You don't want shortcuts. And on the so that's on a psychological level, it's not teaching you the right things. And I think at 20, you're still in a formative stage. So you've got to cultivate character. Um, also, some short term, you know, what I mean is, you know, the, the wrong, if you're taking anything exogenous in, if you're taking the wrong type of supplements or, uh, you know, those kind of things, or if you're doing diets that might be detrimental to your metabolism, or if you're just taking risk with getting injured, those kind of things, then really think twice about those kind of things, because you don't want to be in a situation where anything you've done is irreversible or, or you know, you're still having to pay the price of that down the line. Um, yeah, so I hope that helps if, if you're starting out in your in your 20s. So the, the last question that came through is quite a, a, a big one. It, and let's let's unpack it a little bit. So this one is. I'm in a serious run. I feel down on myself every day and I don't know where to start. Please help. Um, so. Where we would start here is, is I would say from my perspective that, you know, exercise is a vehicle out of this. This, this is what you would consider, you, you could call this the, the, um, the dark night of the soul or, you know, th these kind of things where you're in an absolute rut and you need something pretty drastic to, to change. I think everybody experiences times like this and you need to just focus on the, the the fundamentals to get you out of it so obviously i'm not talking about clinical clinic being clinically depressed or something of that nature if if you feel you're in that scenario then you would consider um or you you would you would seek you would one tell people close to you and and you would consider professional help but if we're talking about maybe something that's a bit more on a on a on a spiritual level, a, a personal development side of things, and you you feel like you're in a real rut and you need to change things, I would make the argument that exercise is a great vehicle out of that, because 
one, you need to stack the odds in your favor. And what I mean by that is you want to change the way you feel uh, immediately. And you can do that with short bursts of exercise. So just getting out for a walk, you want to send the signal to your body that, you know, you're you're getting that vitamin D, you're getting out in that sunshine, you're, you're being active, you're getting your heart rate up, you're giving your muscles a little bit of strain that they can then come back from. So you're sending the right signals. If, if Also, if you're talking about the, the lizard brain, you're sending a signal that you're out again. So you're not scared, you're not hiding, you're out in the open, you're out in the plains. And you, you know that is a good signal to your, to your lizard brain that you're no longer in a, in a fearful state, which is in all of these things, they kind of send the same signal to, to our subconscious. The next thing I would say is, like I say, you have to stack the odds in your favor. The first thing you need to do before you really know how you feel is make sure that you've got exercise covered, you've got nutrition covered. So get out all the processed foods, get out the refined sugar, get the, the highly inflammatory foods down, get the alcohol down and just get nice, nutrient heavy, diverse foods low glycemic index, fruits, uh, vegetables, those kind of things, good sources of food, because you want to give your body every chance it can. It's, it's going to be hard on a, on a psychological level um, and on an emotional level if you feel like you're in that much of a rut and you really need something to change. The first thing you can do is you need to stack the odds in your favor physiologically. Make sure that you invest in your sleep, your sleep environment, um, and, and really try to double down on, on that as well. And then get yourself out of pain if, if you need to get into mobility work. So one of the first things you would do is, is instigate a very short uh, mobility practice every day, just five minutes, six minutes. You'd really, like I say, the, the, the real message there is stack the odds in your favor physiologically. That'll be the first thing you need to do. Um, the next thing would be, is more on the, the personal development on the psychological side. You need to own what has happened. So whether it's been your fault or not, you still need to take ownership of the situation you're in right now and you need to set about a plan. What are the things that you're going to do to get yourself out of this? So sit down with, with a pen and paper, think about everything that has led to this and then think about the things that you can take action on that are gonna get you out of that. So set about a plan, really write out the, the kind of life you want to see and where you want to be physically start that exercise practice again, start the right food coming in again, start sleeping well. And, you know, this is going to get you to the point where you're feeling a little bit better physically. And then we start doing the psychological work, which is then where you really start surrounding yourself with positive people. If you don't have that with positive books, audio material, personal development material, and start setting goals and working towards those, start taking the smallest possible action towards every goal that you can on a daily basis. Every single day has to represent one step forward, one brick in that wall that's going to get you out of this. Every single day has to contribute. And if you get enough days stacked together like that, then things are going to start to change for you and you'll be in a, in a completely different place. Uh, and like I say, Everybody, everybody hits this at some stage in their life, I would say. And, you know, it could be called the, the dark night of the soul, like we say, could just be considered a rut, could be considered a dark time. Um, everybody's going to experience it at some time. And there are certain structures, certain things you can put in place to get you out of it. Stack the odds in your favor physiologically. Sit down with a pen and paper. Take ownership of what's got you here and then start a plan of how to get yourself out and then start acting towards that plan on a daily basis. Uh, and then don't give up. Just every single day, make sure you just you just never entertain the idea that you get up, that you're going to give up. Because, like I say, enough days like that presents a chain, and you know, on a long enough timeline, you will be out of that scenario. So, yeah, I hope that helps, guys. This this is this has been very fun for me. This, if there's any uh, questions, then please send them through now. Otherwise, I'll do this again shortly. I, I'll start with probably once a month, and I'm going to bring in some um, book reviews and things like uh, things like that. And, and some almost lecture style things where I think will help on the personal development side and the mindset side of things. Um, but yeah, if there are any questions, just let me know and we can talk about them now. And if you have any questions over time, then just hit me up on any of the social media or we're working together as online personal training, uh, client and coach relationship, then just give me a message and I can address them there. But yeah, thanks for coming, guys. I've enjoyed this and we're going to do this regularly. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. And subscribe to the YouTube channel if you've enjoyed it. You, that way you'll get notifications about when the next one comes. Um, 
and like I say, I plan to do it once a month, but I think I'm going to start doing other live streams on in like whiteboard sessions, book reviews, those kind of things, because I quite like it. It's quite fun. I like, I like the informal side of things as well. So thank you guys. Thank you for attending. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you soon.